If you've ever been looking everywhere for the sunglasses only to find them on your head, we got a story for you today. There's sunglasses? I thought it was a letter. <laughs> <laughs> if you are coming back, welcome back. But if you are new here, we think that literature deserves a conversation. So we take a conversational approach to discussing and understanding what we read. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Letter Crypto. Letter Crypto? Crypto Letter. Well, those both work. We read The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe today, a story with themes about hiding in the open, expectations, and maybe even just a little bit of overanalyzing your problems. And as always, we start off publication information. The Purloined Letter was first published in the literary annual The Gift in 1844-ish, and soon was republished many times in other journals and newspapers. We will leave links down below where you can listen and read for free. One of the most famous American authors, Edgar Allan Poe. We continue down the journey with him today, but we are going into his detective stories. He came out with three detective stories. This is the third and arguably his most famous and reputable one. Of his detective stories. So the story starts out in this first person narration. And we're hanging out in Paris. We're hanging out with the buddy, Dupin, who's this amateurish detective. And in walks in the prefect from the Paris police. And he's like, hey, man, I got this case. At the Royal Apartments, a very important woman had this letter that she was reading. And, oh, her husband came home, so she had to stash it, right? So where she put it? In plain sight, right on the table. In walks the Minister D. And the Minister D can tell that that is a scandalous letter of sort. That if he got it, <laughs> it could cause, you know, uh, kid, uh, not kidnapping. What's the word I'm looking for? Extortion? Blackmail. Blackmail, blackmail. So in plain sight, he places his letter down that kind of looks like it, grabs hers in front of her as she watches, but she can't say anything because her husband's there and then takes off with it. <laughs> Ooh, so, so is this a love letter? Love letter? Well, is it a love letter? Well, is it a political problem if it were to come out? Who knows? So while we know not only the crime that the letter was stolen, we know the perp. Right, the minister D. We she literally watched him do it. We just don't know where the dang letter is. <laughs> so we know then that the prefect. He's like, all right. So we know who the bad guy is. We know the culprit, but we can't find the letter. We've searched his apartment. We've searched him. We can't find this letter. And he's almost like humbling himself, saying, "Where do you think the letter would be? Because we can't figure it out." And not just searched. I mean, they ripped apart bedposts, the walls, searched behind. Any nook and cranny procedural type search that that very clever criminals put things, but they can't find that letter in his apartment, but they know he has it, right? So the narrator kind of suggests, well, uh, maybe he hid it somewhere else, and our Dupin, our hero, is just like, it's obviously there, go back and look again. So the prefect walks off, and they continue to search the place. A month goes by and Monsieur G comes back and says, look, man, I can't find it. And they start talking about reward money. They start talking about those 50,000 francs. And uh, Dupin's just like, okay, keep, write me a check and I'll, I'll get you that letter. <laughs> Monsieur gives him the check, hands over the letter. Monsieur takes off, right? So it's kind of like, like, that's kind of like act one, if you will. And then act two is the explanation, the rationale behind it, because we knew it was there. Right. We knew it was in the apartment. We knew he had done it, but we couldn't figure out how. So we're, we're playing like an active role as the reader figuring this out. And he goes on to talk about his childhood, about how he played this odds and evens games where he had to kind of guess whether the other person was going to do an odd or an even number. And he talked about the way to win was like he imitated the guy's face, even though that's not exactly how psychology works. But he's trying to get into the mind of his opponent, right? If he was going to try to be crafty versus just try to be straightforward, that's how he needs to react, right? And it's all an allegory for, okay, this guy that stole it, he's, I don't think he's very creative, so he probably put it in a really dumb place. And that's where I'm going to go look. I'm not going to go look in all these crafty places is kind of the, the story that he gets across there, right? Pick, pick, a, pick anywhere on the globe. You're probably going to pick some obscure place. But if someone's crafty or not crafty, they might just pick like a really obvious place like Russia, right? But you don't pick Russia because that's so obvious. Hence, we have the main point of the purloin letter hiding in plain sight. He reveals that he'd walked over to the apartment and it's just like right there, like on, on the tray out in the open, just flipped inside out and addressed differently, like <laughs> pr pretty easy. So he just 
put in like a fake letter instead, grab that letter. And that fake letter, he had like a little hidden message between, between these two names that we're going to have to talk about. So that's how he came into possession of the letter as he found it hiding in plain sight, if you will. I love this idea because I explain this sometimes through the acronym KISS, Keep It Simple Stupid. And it's genius while still being very, very simple because he fooled the cops for a well over a month and it took somebody to think in a different term or it took somebody to think like a criminal or like somebody that isn't as crafty as the cops were. And he was able to find the letter very quickly. I love that. It's a, it's a fun little story. And arguably, I think the letter was hiding in plain sight twice, right? Like arguably, okay, maybe maybe the, the madam couldn't get rid of the letter fast enough, but she just put it on the table as the husband's walking around the, the place. It's just sitting right there in plain sight, like this potentially really scandalous letter. And that's how, you know, Mons- uh, Minister D steals the letter is because it was hiding in plain sight. And that's exactly where he hid it when he got to his apartment. Yeah, the way that I took that is that if something isn't broke, don't try to fix it. And he's like, well, <laughs> she hit it out in plain sight and it worked. It fooled her husband. So I'm going to hide it in plain sight and it'll fool the cops. And indeed it did. So it, it, maybe he stole the idea. Maybe it wasn't his at, after all. So I don't, I don't mean to say stealing the idea, but obviously a predecessor. Um, we got to talk about the dates behind this too, because sometimes we talk about how stories I- I inspire other things, right? We had... Uh, we had basically the A Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury predated the butterfly Mandela effect, right? We had Jorge Luis Borges' The Garden of Forking Path uh, predated the many worlds, you know, scientific theory. And this one predates really general acceptance of psychoanalysis, psychoanalytical behavior in police work, basically. And, and also even predates uh, Sherlock Holmes, if you didn't know. Is this this idea that life imitates art and then art imitates life. I mean, if somebody started reading these things and they came up with the idea of psychology and police profiling and all of that, they had to get that idea from somewhere. I mean, it could have been as old back as Poe in the early 1800s. Wow. That's, he is the author that keeps on giving in so many different regards of life, not just literature. All right, so what's the main moral of this story? Is it hiding something in plain sight? I think it's more the idea of subversion of expectations of people and what they think you will do. Maybe a little bit of don't overanalyze too, right? Like Dupin kind of outsmarted him by not being too smart. <laughs> and it's a, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors, I would say, right? Like we have the narrator who does a good job of being a stand-in, I feel like, for us as the reader. He doesn't know the answer, but we, the reader, know the answer. We know who stole it. We know when they stole it. We <laughs> we know the crime, and all the facts are there. We just have to figure it out. And he kind of goes down these wrong you know, ways of thinking, like, well, maybe he hid it somewhere else. And Dupin is the smartest guy in the room. He already knows the answer. He already knows you know, what the mistake was. And he's able to... Uh, Poe is able to write a character smarter than everyone, the character that's the smartest person in the room, when he's able to give you all of these facts and we can't figure it out, but they already have it figured out. Were you disappointed with the ending that it was just hidden in plain sight? Were you expecting some big twist or reveal? I mean, I know this story is pushing 200 years old now, but I was satisfied with this very simple answer. I was like, huh, that's kind of genius and stupidity. Yeah, I liked it too, because I thought his examples were really good with the, you know, pick anywhere on a globe, the odds and evens game, because we've all done that before, like with rock, paper, scissors, right? Like I pick rock and and I win. So, you know, we're going to get ready to go for the next round. Do you pick rock again? Because they think you're obviously going to change it. So maybe I'll just stick with rock, right? Like those games we've all played of what do I think the other person's going to do? Because that's arguably more important than just a random guess. Criminal minds, baby. Criminal minds. <laughs> and I think it wraps up well with that final letter, which I think is a little hidden nugget. Did you notice the two names on it? They were Greek names, but I didn't know who they were. I didn't remember their story. So basically, they're brothers, and one brother sleeps with the other's wife. <laughs> okay. So the tale oldest time. Right. So the, the brother that was offended murders the other's kids and serves them up in Sioux stew to be eaten. <laughs> oh, oh, man. 
so oh, so dark sometimes. So the argument though is is his actions justified because the one brother committed the first crime, so therefore the getting back at him is justified. Like is it okay eye for an eye basically? It's kind of one of the main points for that story. Does, and it, yeah, does the crime fit the bill? Yeah, and it makes you fit the crime. And it makes you question, oh, did he leave that there because Minister D and him have some sort of a past? And now there is other stories, right? This is the second or third in the trilogy or this series? Is the, this is the third one. I haven't read third. one. I've read Murder in the Room War, but I haven't read the other one. So I don't know if there's a past between them explored and the other one. I don't remember it being in, in the other one. Uh, but but it, if you know if we look at this as a standalone, I think it raises the good question of do we think... You know, Dupin did this basically to get back at something that Minister D did to him earlier, and therefore it's justified the 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 dual criminal slap of I was justified in stealing the letter because you did the first wrong. There has to be some type of connection between them. I, I, their names are Dupin and D, right? I mean, that's not a coincidence. At least I didn't take it as a coincidence. You never know. But they did draw a lot of connections with poetry, right? Like, oh, well, he's poet. He's a poet, right? He's creative. So obviously, you know, you don't want to overthink things, which is what obviously- Don't overanalyze. The, pref <laughs> the, the prefect's, you know, mistake was. And then they bring in the mathematics, too, where they talk about how, well, you know, mathematics are procedural. And that's exactly what the prefect was doing as well. And whether you're going to go for the creative option or the more straightforward, this is what we always do, procedural type approach, I think that's kind of Poe's main argument with this story is know your enemy, don't overanalyze things, particularly if they're the one that's just going to go for the direct, obvious answer sort of thing. And uh, I think it's a good lesson in looking into the psyche of other people because, you know, if you think about it, when you come home and you put your keys on the counter, after work or, you know, if you've been out for the day, you usually put it in one of, you know, three spots. Okay. I put it either right when I walk in, right by my bed stand, or they're in my pant pockets. Right. And you're running late for work the next day. And you're like, I can't find my keys. It's not by the bed stand. It's not by the, the door where I walk in. And you start looking all around the house. You start looking in stupid yeah. places like by the couch, you know, did I put it over by the sink when I was washing the dishes? And you, don't in the think refrigerator. About, and you don't think about the obvious place of, did I check my pant pockets that I had worn the night before? Like the most obvious place. Sunglasses, like we talked about in the opening, right? I usually wear them on my head. But when I'm sitting here looking at them and they're not in the usual place in my car, where could they possibly be? They're on your dang head where they normally go, right? Like for some reason, there's that hidden in plain sight. The most obvious answer is, is the one that you don't check because it's just too obvious. Like we do this mistake a lot. And I like how Poe brings it out and kind of injects it into the story very beautifully. So let's wrap it up there and we'll leave a link below where you can go to our Poe playlist. And uh, Una, give me your very subjective rating on this one. How you, what are you going to give this? This is a fun story. I got a lot of pleasure out of this one. I'm going to give it mm, nine out of 10. All right, nine out of 10. I'm going to give this one a solid eight. I think this is very useful for um, a, a young reader. I think it's very easy and approachable. Uh, I like what Poe did here. And sometimes we expect an ending that is something that is very convoluted because in modern day society, we're always looking for the M. Night Shyamalan, like big reveal. And this one doesn't have that. So it kind of itself goes against what the norm is. And I like that. And I think this is kind of one of the first styles of writing this story uh, and i think that it inspired a lot of other things so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a solid eight all right guys we post videos every monday and thursday if you'd like to join us on the literature discussions hit that subscribe button down below una out peace <laughs>